Today on Oklahoma Gardening, I'll share with you how your bulbs will handle the variable spring weather. We then turn our attention to getting our raised beds ready for another season. I'll offer some tips to avoid fake plant scams. We get an update on the OSU student farm. And finally, Jessica Riggin offers another tasty treat. Underwriting assistance for our program is provided by the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry, helping to keep Oklahoma green and growing. So if you're looking for an easy, low maintenance perennial, have two different types of flowers on one plant. Face noise that gives the pepper its heat. You've probably noticed that first bit of green that's already breaking through the soil this spring from your spring bulbs. And while we're not out of winter yet, there's really not too much concern about that green foliage that's breaking through at this point especially if the bulbs are on a south facing or southwest side of your house, a lot of times they will break sooner because of the extra warmth that they're getting. Now, what you're seeing is coming up really is more of the vegetative foliage. Um, and while we still might have some cold temperatures, there can be some burning that happens from those cold temperatures on those uh, leaves that are coming up. You can see here, some of our tips have turned brown, but you're still going to have your flower buds because most of the buds are still below the ground therefore they're insulated by that soil. This is why in the fall when you're planting your bulbs you want to make sure you're planting them at the appropriate soil depth. If you plant them too shallow there is potential that they will um, respond to fluctuating soil temperatures more readily and therefore they might actually grow too soon exposing them to those colder temperatures. Now as they're growing of course you can see we've got the vegetation that's coming up but as long as those flower buds remain below ground for some time they are going to be insulated from those colder temperatures. If you have some that are starting to sprout already the actual flower buds this is more of a concern on your hybrid tulips because really that is your investment you bought that and here in Oklahoma they are treated as an annual. So if you lose your flower buds because they are already up, then you have unfortunately lost your investment on those hybrid tulips. Daffodils, crocus, and hyacinths, however, are perennials. So while those buds may freeze if they are already above ground, um, they will return next year to try to give you another display. As that foliage is starting to emerge, if we do have a cold snap, usually it will slow down that emergence a little bit. So it will slow down that process. However, here in Oklahoma, we've also been known to have summers one day and then it turned back into winter the next day. And we've had snow on the ground while our bulbs are actually breaking color and beginning to bloom. So if you are in that situation, if we end up having a late um, snowstorm as our bulbs are beginning to bloom, while these are no longer protected by the soil, don't forget that you can always cut them and bring them indoors. A lot of our spring bulbs make really great cut flowers. Um, and so it's just as simple as cutting them and bringing them indoors. And you can see here, we've got a beautiful display of tulips that you can add to your home. The nice thing about spring bulbs is not only will they brighten up a room with their color, but often their fragrance as well. One thing to keep in mind if you're doing this with daffodils, you want to make sure to put daffodils in a separate container because they actually contain a crystal called calcium oxalate. And this crystal can actually be detrimental to other plants, especially the delicate tulips. It's time to start getting our garden beds ready for planting. And we've got some cool season transplants we're gonna be planting and also, of course, our warm season plants as we get closer to April. But before we get any planting done, we need to make sure that our beds are ready. So today we're gonna to talk about making sure that our beds are ready and how to do that. Over the years, we've built a lot of raised beds and I love raised beds for multiple reasons, including the fact that they elevate the planting so that you don't have to bend or stoop over so much, 
but also it allows you to kind of control the soil or the planting media that you put into your raised bed. Now, the problem with that is you have to get a lot of materials depending on how tall your raised bed is. And as you've probably seen over the years, I've been a big proponent of incorporating a lot of garden debris into your raised bed, especially on that initial bottom layer before you add about six to eight inches of soil or potting soil, depending on your condition, what you're adding in. So the thing is though, when you add this material, right, it decomposes and that's on purpose, it's supposed to. That actually adds beneficial organic matter into the soil and the raised bed that you're creating. Now the problem with that is over the years, you can see that our soil level has um, fallen and shrunken down as that organic matter has decomposed. So it's that time of year, we're getting our gardens ready and so we need to evaluate what we need to do with some of these. Now the first thing you need to do, of course, is take out any irrigation that you might have so we don't bury our irrigation lines. But then the next thing is, is consider whether it's worth adding more organic matter. So we're gonna add a few more leaves. Again, this is just stuff that we've collected around the garden as we're cleaning up. Um, and we can probably get a few more buckets of this and add in. And this is just going to be volume and space filler in this. The really critical component that we're gonna add and really allow those plants to grow in is a nice mix of topsoil and compost. So we are using some topsoil in this because it is a larger raised bed. On containers and some of our elevated tables, we're only gonna use uh, potting soil really because we wanna make sure that it does continue to have good drainage. So you can see I've got a good amount in there and what I'm going to do is just sort of work this in because otherwise we've really got different layers. So we've got some soil obviously underneath here. We're just going to kind of turn this over a little bit and then I will proceed with adding some more topsoil and compost on top of it to finish off the level. So we're just going to continue to bring up our soil level here. So now that we've got our bed filled, we're just going to sort of smooth this out um, and we pretty much have it ready to go and ready to plant. And that's kind of the nice thing about this early spring time is to get your beds ready. So we've added compost and uh, topsoil and incorporated that in with the leaves below. So we're really kind of churning that in. So it's kind of the same consistency throughout. And when we do plant, we'll probably top dress with a little uh, fertilizer and that fertilizer will, will further help uh, decompose those leaves so that they're not stealing any of that nitrogen from our plants. So we've got our bed here ready to go, but I wanna show you or give you an update on one of our raised beds that we built a couple of years ago. And this was our straw wattle garden. You might remember um, this little segment that we did as kind of a fun idea. And this is using one of those erosion straw tubes that you see in construction areas. Um, they're about $45 and it was kind of an easy proposal to make a raised bed. Well, I wanna give you an update in the fact that you'll probably only get maybe two growing seasons out of this. So you can see here the material that held the straw wattle um, and so this is the straw. It of course is going to decompose and that's what it should do. Um, but this sort of leaves this plastic in your garden bed and it's no longer holding up the edges. So it's nice that we put these pavers down as a perimeter. We can still utilize this, but I'm gonna go ahead and pull up this plastic. Um, and then again, we will add more soil to this bed also. So over the winter, we've also built a few more garden beds, including this one that we put around our little hobby greenhouse that we have here in our backyard demonstration garden. Now, the reason why we put in a small sort of foundation garden bed around our uh, hobby greenhouse is because of a few reasons. You can see that the base of our foundation um, is pavers. And while we put some support in there, it's sort of um, sloughing off a little bit. And that's because we had raised our foundation initially because all of this area is a little bit low. So we wanted to make sure that it didn't flood. Um, so in doing that, 
we wanted to add more soil around that foundation to help support it and kind of hold up and reinforce those pavers a little bit more. The second thing is, you know, sort of the whole idea of foundation planting. A lot of times people put plants up around their houses and stuff like that. And that's just to kind of soften and cover some of those hard edges, right, that we have up around our house. And so we're doing the same thing around our hobby greenhouse here. Now, one thing you want to take into consideration when you're adding soil to a new bed is what plant material you're gonna incorporate. And because there's a lot of screening and aggregate already in here, we wanted something that's gonna be drought tolerant. And I'm excited about what we've decided to put in here. And that's that province lavender. You might remember from last season, we talked about it. We've had one planted in our herb spiral garden and it's done terrific for several years. So this last winter, we took several cuttings of it and we've got a lot of um, cuttings rooted and growing in the greenhouse that we're gonna plant along here. Now, lavender likes a lot of good drainage and so it should get plenty of that with this aggregate, kind of this really small crushed up gravel that's going to allow for more pore space and drainage around those roots. So we're gonna mix that again with some compost and topsoil and get this filled in and we're gonna fill it up to again, reinforce our foundation and it will be ready for those cuttings to plant soon. Did you know in 2021, 18 million Americans started gardening and on average, they spent about $500 on garden related items that year. This is big business. In fact, it led up to about a $48 billion industry nationally. Now, just like you, I am excited every year when we get the catalogs and all the seed catalogs to find out what new plants are available. But also, everybody knows spring is the gardening season. And unfortunately, there can be a lot of gimmicks, especially on the internet. So as you're looking for your seeds, be mindful of this. And one easy way to find out whether it's a gimmick or not is to simply follow up with a more thorough internet search. Search on the internet as to what that plant is and if it is available at multiple vendors. A lot of times you might find that some of these gimmicks are only available at one website or they're available at like a crafting website, which means that they're probably not a legitimate plant. If it is a true legitimate plant, you'll often find that they are available at multiple vendors and several of those are often reputable nurseries that have been around for a long time. Recently, I've seen social media posts about a pink sunflower. Now, I'm not going to say that there is no such thing as a pink sunflower, but please look at the picture that they're trying to sell you. If you do a quick internet search for pink sunflower, the first thing that you should do is, again, look for that reputable vendor. Many seed companies like Johnny's and Burpee Gardens have been around for a long time. When you see the pink sunflowers that they are offering, they look a little more realistic and have shades of yellow and maroon. Now these are real plants, while other companies are presenting pictures of hot pink and even purple sunflowers that are likely photoshopped pictures. Furthermore, if you look at the reviews of many of these questionable sources, there are comments suggesting that the plants do not reflect the color in which the customer was anticipating. Many of these gimmicks offer seeds because seeds are the cheapest material for them to repackage and ship. It takes a long period of time for the customer to find out it's a gimmick, and there's plenty of opportunity for the customer to actually never find out that it's a gimmick because the plant might actually die before it blooms. Another example is a few years ago, I was asked by a gardener about some rose seeds that were said to have a rainbow of vibrant colors on each flower. Roses have been hybridized for centuries and do come in some really amazing colors, but if it looks too good to be true or natural, it probably is. Again, a quick internet search of rainbow roses can bring up some beautiful images of roses. And while again, some of these probably are photoshopped, some are likely real images. However, these real images of rainbow roses are flowers that have been dyed. Dyed roses can be purchased as cut flowers and may be seen in the floral industry, but do not expect to grow these in the garden. It's sort of like the blue poinsettias that we see at Christmas time that have been dyed or painted. Now, what can make this whole thing even more tricky is the fact that plant breeding has really advanced. 
At the same time, heirloom and unique international selections are becoming more available. So we're seeing some more really interesting plants that are truly legitimate plants, such as the cheddar cauliflower, the black beauty tomato, or the glass gem corn. These don't look at all like our traditional white cauliflower, red tomato, or yellow corn, but again, if you search the internet, you will find that there's multiple reputable sources for these seeds. As we begin this gardening season, I want us to all get off on the right foot. Don't let the internet fool you into buying magic beans. Instead, be an informed consumer. It's March and we're back out here at the new OSU student farm. And as you can see, a lot's happened in the last month. Joining me today is Matt Bairtrack, who is one of the managers of the student farm. Matt, how did we get to this point so quickly? Um, so we got to this point, um, since we last talked, we have put up an eight foot tall deer fence. Uh, we got to keep these deer out. There's lots of deer around this area. And, and since we last talked, um, we were fortunate enough to have of Great Plains Cubota donate a tractor and a land pride tiller to us. Mm -hmm. So two big expensive items that are necessary to make this make this all work. Right, so you've tilled in some of your cover crop and you're doing strip tilling. Tell me about that method. Yeah, we like to strip till just as a, a more of a conservation method. And really it plays into how we, how we plant. Uh, two other pieces of equipment that we, we actually purchased are a bed shaper. Uh, it's a bed shaper slash uh, mulch layer and it also lays drip tape so it does three things at once. Plastic mulch is popular and for a lot of different reasons um, but also you're not using it for cool season crops why are you choosing not to use it now? Uh, we're not using them now because the weed pressure isn't so great uh, we will probably use it for our warm season crops okay. tomatoes peppers okra they really thrive under that and it'll reduce you know reduce that weed pressure and, and a lot of hand weeding which we'll still hand weed these and as you can see, these beds are, are raised up, raised row beds. Mm -hmm. And what that does, it, it does reduce the, the, uh, the amount of weed pressure that, that, that we see. And um, it really helps if we get a lot of heavy spring rains, nothing will wash out. Okay. These, will, these will withstand. In 2019, when we had all those, uh, when we had that flood here, uh, we still had all of our beds. Everything was just fine. Uh, but a lot of places got washed out. Right. For a homeowner, I mean, so these are raised beds yes. for a field sort of operation. Different than what maybe a backyard gardener might think of as a raised bed, but essentially the same thing, right? You're yes. getting water on there, but you're also allowing for it to drain pretty rapidly. If drains and, and it really drains and holds water well. Um, and since we have, you know, uh, buried irrigation, we're not wasting any water. Right. Everything is put exactly where it needs to be. And through our, our water, we also, we also, we also fertigate. So we actually add uh, our nutrients through an injector and it runs through our drip line right to where the plants need it. So we're not, we're not just fertilizing a whole space and just some plants with the grasses and everything. We're fertilizing right where it needs to go. Perfect. Well, I know you guys got a lot planted in no time, it seems like, and that's thanks to that transplanter yep. um, planter machine. Tell me a little bit about it. Um, now that's one of the pieces of equipment we just got. It's brand new, uh, it's very efficient. So basically we have two seats and we take all of our transplants or what we're, the row we're gonna plant. And that, that makes a hole, it irrigates the hole with a, it has water, a water tank on top. So it drips water into the hole that you make and then all the person that's writing has to do is put the plant in the ground and then squeeze it, squeeze it down and it's planted. And you can keep going, it's super efficient. We planted about, about uh, 2,500 plants in maybe two hours. Okay, and, and you've got a few more rows to go. You're planting cool season crops right now. Yep. And I say you, but really it's the students that are doing yep, it, yep. right? Um, myself and Linda, and then we have four, four students, um, a couple horticulture students and a couple uh, non-horticulture students too and they've been really helpful. It's, it's uh, made this so much easier. If we didn't have them, me and Linda would still be out here, you know, on two rows. <laughs> and then of course, classes I believe are coming out to kind of participate yes, and we see have, some uh, of this process as well. We have urban, urban horticulture class and uh, we've actually had some environmental science kids and uh, um, some other kids taking soil samples out here. 
So you're planting cool season crops. Tell me what some of the crops are that you're actually planting. So some of the crop, crops we planted today, we have uh, a few rows of cabbage. We have a few rows of broccoli and cauliflower. And next, uh, tomorrow, we're actually going to plant lettuce and onions and spinach all right and i assumed you hardened those off prior to yes. planting them um, they've been hardening off for about a week at okay. the greenhouse learning center so basically we just they were in the greenhouse and we took them outside so they could get acclimated to the weather uh, and luckily we've had you know pretty nice weather um, and they are cool season so they can take you know down to freezing which uh, which is good i think we have some freezing temperatures coming up but that's next week and by then these should be strong enough to withstand any any, uh, you know, if it's a major freeze, we might have to come out here and cover them. But since it's just a light freeze, they should they be should able to take it, yeah. Okay, well, I know that's kind of always the touchy thing about when to plant cool season crops and you gotta take advantage when you can. Yep. Um, but it's too early for warm season crops. Yeah, but a that, too early. You're already starting to think about that? You got them growing? Yeah, we've started peppers and then we'll probably start tomatoes, um, you know, this week. In the greenhouse. In the greenhouse, yeah. <laughs> yeah. We'll start them in you know, protected greenhouse, let them grow. Peppers take a while to, to germinate. And then tomatoes, not so much, but, uh, you know, we still want to get over a month on them in the greenhouse and right. get really uh, nice and rooted. All right. Well, Matt, thank you so much for the update. And we'll be back in April when it's time for tomatoes. All right. Sounds good. Uh, today I have brought with me a rutabaga and if you are not familiar with rutabaga maybe you've heard of it but have never eaten it it is related to a turnip it looks a lot like a turnip but it is more yellow in color where a turnip is going to be whiter and maybe have a little bit of a purple tinge to the skin of it a rutabaga is also more mild in flavor than a turnip is so if you've had a turnip and you thought oh, I don't really like that Still try the rutabaga because it's got a very mild, almost sweet flavor and um, it will take on the flavors of the seasonings that you cook it with. Rutabaga is a root vegetable and so it can be used anywhere that you'd use any other root vegetable. So you could replace potato with rutabaga. The rutabaga is a little bit lower in carbohydrates and higher in fiber than a potato is. Um, and it's a little bit softer in texture. And so today I'm gonna to be making a rutabaga fry that's roasted in the oven instead of fried. But you absolutely could do this in your air fryer if you have one, it would probably be delicious that way. And I wanna point out this rutabaga came from the grocery store and you can probably maybe see that it has wax on the outside of it. So when you buy vegetables at the grocery store and fruits, a lot of times they will put wax on the outside of the skin, kind of to protect that skin from getting uh, punctured in transit. We're gonna peel this, and so that wax is gonna come off as I peel it. But if you had another fruit or vegetable with wax on it that you aren't peeling, you wanna make sure that you wash it off um, before you eat it. I wanted to mention that sometimes when you're working with a plastic cutting board, it can tend to twist around and move and rock. But if you'll put a clean dish towel underneath it, that'll usually stabilize it and keep it still for you. I have cut my rutabaga into four inch strips and it is a little tough to cut through like a sweet potato. Um, once I've got it cut up, I'm just going to drizzle in some olive oil and then I'm going to season it with a little seasoned salt. You could use just like a generic seasoned salt or you could use garlic salt or whatever you like. I found some truffle salt online and I just was really interested to try it. So that's what I'm using today. Um, I like the flavor of truffles, which, you know, as a type of mushroom, it's kind of um, earthy and different and it's just kind of a little fancy. So now I've got it tossed together. I'm going to put it on my cookie sheet in a single layer meaning I don't want any of it stacked on top of each other because as it roasts, if it's stacked or uh, if the pan is overcrowded, it will steam instead of roasting. And then I'm gonna put it in a 425 degree oven for about 20 minutes. All right, my rutabaga fries are out of the oven. They didn't take quite 20 minutes, so you do wanna keep an eye on them because 
all ovens are going to be a little bit different and it may depend on the way that you sliced your your rutabaga here um, and i'm just going to plate it up they have a nice brown color on one side um, you can get a more even color if you turn them halfway through cooking which i didn't do today and that's that's fine i kind of like the look of having them unevenly colored and these you can serve just like you would serve uh, potato french fries with ketchup or whatever condiments you like. I'll serve them on the side of a hamburger or a steak, just whatever you're having for dinner. We'll garnish it with a little bit of parsley just to have something green on the plate. Here we are, roasted rutabaga fries. I hope you'll try it. There are a lot of great horticulture activities this time of year. Be sure and consider some of these events in the weeks ahead. Next week on Oklahoma Gardening, we'll share the secret to success in gardening. To find out more information about show topics as well as recipes, videos, articles, fact sheets, and other resources, including a directory of local extension offices, be sure to visit our website at oklahomagardening.okstate.edu. Join in on Facebook and Instagram. You can find this entire show and other recent shows as well as individual segments on our Oklahoma Gardening YouTube channel. Tune in to our OK Gardening Classics YouTube channel to watch segments from previous hosts. Oklahoma Gardening is produced by the Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service as part of the Division of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources at Oklahoma State University. The Botanic Garden at OSU is home to our studio gardens, and we encourage you to come visit this beautiful Stillwater gem. We would like to thank our generous underwriter, the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry. Additional support is also provided by Greenleaf Nursery and the Garden Debut Plants, the Oklahoma Horticulture Society, the Tulsa Garden Club, and the Tulsa Garden Center.